Hi, I'm Stacy Hoke, psychotherapist, somatic embodiment coach, author of Imperfectly Sane and Earn Your Luck, a field guide for living beyond your narcissistic parents' wildest dreams, and a mama of four. I'm in private practice and I live in the Northeast of America. I have two dogs, one who might disrupt this video, um, but he's new, so he's cute. His name is Oakley. So this is gonna be a long, um, overdue introduction to this channel and a dedication all the same. So my work has evolved over the years because I was a psychotherapist and I was a theoretically healed person um, in, my, in the relational realm before I came to understand what my audience actually was sharing with me in response to my own experiences. So I had clinical textbook knowledge of narcissism and they say in school that when you're too, or just in general, when you're too close to a pattern, it's like holding the nose, your nose to a mirror and you can't see your pore when it's right here if you're trying to like pop something. But if you pull back, you can see what you're looking for. I was raised under the realm of narcissistic abuse, physical abuse. There's lots of abuse that comes with that. But the worst form of abuse, in my opinion, is the narcissistic abuse. If I would have just been hit, if I would have just been theoretically like neglected and put in situations that were dangerous for me, um, if it didn't have the undertone of hell constantly, which comes with narcissistic abuse, it would have been an easier life. I would actually had like a home base at some point, which you don't ever get when you're a child of a narcissist, especially two narcissists. Um, or a borderline and a narcissist, or a borderline leaning narcissist and a covert narcissist, right? There's many um, differentiations of this, but those two were never connected, my parents, right? So um, I was very triangulated. And this work that I do is dedicated to children of narcissists because I want us to understand one thing that I think a lot of us do not. And if you had even one person in your life, like a mentor or something, you probably fared differently than the person who is literally isolated by constant triangulation, right? Like I was not allowed to be in relationship with anyone. I was now retrospectively understanding it, manipulated to have a common enemy with the outside world. What do you think that does to my mind now as an adult, right? So I was... I did some work, uh, somatic work with Anadea Judith once. I took a training with her and they asked like, you know, in your family, were you the manipulator? Were you the withdrawler? Like, what were you in your dynamics? And I said, like, I was in charge of my family. I was literally in charge. And she said, no, you were manipulated to believe that you were in charge. My head was like, what? What, what are you talking about? Like, that can't be possibly true. Like, I was literally in charge. I was the therapist. I was like, my energy dominated the space, right? But that's because my mom was always looking at me and projecting this fantasy image of me. And, and what I know now is that the reason that I've, I've experienced such conflict, because I was both, I was a scapegoat, which is weird, because I was the only child of my two parents and they had four, my, my dad had four other kids and that was a weird, complicated thing. But I was the scapegoat. I was treated like the evil stepdaughter by my biological mother who thought I deserved nothing. She would say, if I got something, she would say, don't tell your sisters, like you don't really deserve this. If they're not getting it, you shouldn't have it. Um, they weren't even her kids and they were only there. You know, like it, it was just this thing that made me feel separated from everybody constantly. So she often would project onto me like, you're never satisfied, you're never satisfied. So I grew up believing I deserved nothing and that what I wanted, and I want you to read Earn Your Luck if you resonate with this, everything that I wanted, I felt guilt associated with want. So it was easier to eventually just stop wanting and stop taking a shower and stop taking care of my actual self, start completely rejecting my body, not wanting to live, right? I was taught that because I would see something in the store and go, oh, that's amazing. Can I have that? Or I love this. If I even said I love that, she'd be like, you're so ungrateful. You just got this thing. So eventually, and you know, I, on an, a soul essence level, and this is why I do this work with children of narcissists specifically, because people who were not raised that way, they had a self to go back to. They understood they lost themselves. But children of narcissists and my, the person I'm talking to, our energy didn't match our relational patterns. Like we wanted to connect. Our energy was like, I'm in here. I love you. I, I am, I deeply feel you, but 
I don't know actually how to cognitively relate to another person because I was never allowed to connect to another person. There was never a connecting point. It was always, I remember a time and I would say, you know, I was never good narcissistic supply for my mother because I would always be like, you're insane. Like she would hit me and then lay on me and beg me to tell her that I loved her. And but I would just lay there, right? I survived mentally speaking on having to learn how to theoretically manipulate a narcissistic mind. And I thought all minds were like that, except mine, right? I was the exception. I'm like, I, I don't think like this, but obviously the world does because I was shut off from the outer world in some weird ways. Like my parents let like people live with me and stuff, but it was always under their, they got to look superior. They got to look like they were the, the savior because they're letting my friends live with me who are like, I, my boyfriend was a living boyfriend with me when I was 13 until I was 15 years old. That's just not normal. I have an, a 19 and 17 year old child. Like, right, that's not normal. But now I can see that on a level, that was my discard. That was my, I, I don't want to deal with you, but I have to deal with you. And at the same time, I was becoming, um, you know, more of a woman. And I think that that really triggered my mom about what she believes about men and women. And I wasn't allowed to really be a woman. So here's my boyfriend. My mom kind of looks like she's saving him. My family looks like they're altruistic. Um, and then when I ended up later, after my mom would constantly tell me I was going to be a teenage pregnant person, um, for absolutely no reason. I just heard it my whole life since I was a child. Um, when I was 19, I did get pregnant and then I became wicked. Co and at the same time, I was told I had cancer and my grandmother died in the same week. I was five months pregnant. My grandmother died, who was, I had lived with my whole life. And, um, I was told I had cancer and I remember that period of time calling my mom at work incessantly every single day. And she'd be like, why are you calling me? Right. There was always in that time, I was a good source of narcissistic supply for her because I was always paying attention to her. And despite that, I wasn't saying, oh, you're an amazing mom, blah, blah, blah. My need triggered that initiation of like desiring conflict. So she knew she existed. Cause I wouldn't call her from a place of conflict. I would call her like, Hey, like, I don't, know. I don't know. I just, I felt, I don't know what it was, but I became insanely codependent, um, through probably the entirety of my twenties. So I write, uh, imperfectly sane. I'm doing YouTube videos just about my own healing, about my own practice. And people start saying, Hey, my mom was a narcissist too. Or my dad was a narcissist too. I don't really pay that much attention to it. Right. I'm just like, Oh yeah, that's a label. Like we can all basically change, which is true. Um, I have seen my parents change. Um, but what I am learning about that change is one, they changed because I changed. I am no longer, um, in any way. I'm not, I'm not tied to being that supply. And I'm not tied to what they supply me because when you're a kid raised by a narcissist, you have to become like that. You take scraps and you think it's a crown. You think, oh my God, they gave me something that, oh my God, I, do I deserve this? I'm not sure. And then you start to do that in life, right? So if you're raised by a narcissist and they're projecting onto you their own fantasy about you and, and you're, um, you start to believe the fantasy you can't, how are you supposed to escape when the only escape is to their fantasy? And normally their fantasy, if you're not providing them with exactly what they want out of you, your character, is that you are the devil. And then we take that on and we actually take our most, and here's the other thing that I realized, which still is very uncomfortable for me to sit with. See, I've always understood my mom. I had to, I had to, to, to survive, but I've always been insanely empathic and empathic enough to know what it feels like to be a person who doesn't have empathy. And my whole life, my mom was void of that. Like she would use her story. She, and it's so interesting that I grew up and I shared my story and my mom could say, Oh, you use your story, right? Like she'll project this onto me, but I share my story because it's reality. And she would always say, face reality, Stacy, face reality, Stacy. What she wanted me to face was her fantasy that I was deformed, that I was the problem. So, um, where am I going with that?
I don't remember where I'm going with it. As you can tell, guys, none of my stuff, I'm not reading something when I talk. I am like just going off the cuff, so I apologize. Um, Hmm. Okay. Anyway. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. The story. She used the story. She would always say, while she was hitting me, you don't know what it's like to get hit. She would always say, my father beat my mother senseless and it was horrible. And he beat my family and he raped my sister. And I grew up in hell and I'm giving you heaven compared to that. She would always invalidate my reality not only my reality the reality my existence with her story that I used to care so much about I would be like I want to save my mom like why would somebody do this to these people right and I realize that I and so it's something I'm really uncomfortable with that you know she's also the same person who when I found out that one of my best friends who I let into my life for a really long time was a child molester and I had let him around my children she literally laughed and said, ah, and the dumbass was stupid enough to get caught. When she would say things like, why do you care about saving the world? I wouldn't believe her. I'd be like, there's nobody who she obviously, she's just so wounded in there that she doesn't let herself receive love, that she doesn't let herself know that love exists, right? She's just so wounded in there. I wouldn't believe that when she said, oh, you know, what happened to my sister happened to all of us. She needs to get over it, right? We all moved on. I couldn't imagine somebody not caring about their sister who's locked up in a mental institution and saying what I knew to be true based on the family dynamics that she just needs to get over it. I couldn't imagine her not caring when she's sharing her trauma. She didn't share it because she cared about it. She shared it because she wanted me to care about her. Hence the birth of an empath. A true, full-fledged, like, unstoppable filter of, oh my God, I can feel all these. She systematically opened these gates in me that I cared about her more than I cared about me. I cared about her story and her trauma because, and she, that was a systematic ploy to make it so that I, my reality was undermined and her fantasy was reality. And I'm not saying that what her fantasy is wasn't accurate it was absolutely accurate but she lived in hell and she stayed there and she never individuated from hell and I never individuated from her and then the work once you individuate from that parent is oh fuck I'm still in hell I have to individuate from the frequency of being in hell so my work with children of narcissists is that we often employ their methods when we leave their petri dish and we go, I don't understand, like I'm so willing to connect, but I just, I choose people who are unavailable or I become unavailable. And how could you possibly survive when your reality is constantly undermined? When your, everything about the way that you exist, you're told is bad. And then all of a sudden somebody comes up to you and they start to love you and you literally will look at them like they're weak. This is not you being a narcissist. This is you being a normal person after narcissistic abuse. You will go, this can't be real. You can't be real. Where's the flaw here? What's going on? I'm confused. Because you're so used to having to live in somebody else's fantasy that you become this person that you really aren't even. And your energy doesn't match. You, I was always a very light person when I was in a good way. Right? I was always, like, I know my essence. I always knew my essence. But I was completely enveloped by and suffocated by this cognitive paradigm that I was raised on and that it didn't match the nature of my vertical self right I was always ping-ponging and if you can even understand this please read earn your luck because I, I write this is what I'm writing about in earn your luck but um you will assume that another person who is actually coming in at you to love you that they have a fantasy that they're loving instead of you. You will go, what are they seeing right now? Because it can't be me because nobody ever, I don't even know what they would see if they saw me. Nobody ever saw me. So like, what would, what are they looking for? And then you try to become that thing or you rebel against the thing you think they're looking for, right? Because you're like, well, I don't want you to love that thing that everybody else loved that I put up that facade because that's really not me. And if you love that, then I'm going to hate you. Or they become the thing, the fantasy. 
and they don't know how to connect to a real person who really loves them as a real person. So they become like a person who's raised after from a narcissist will look at that and go, what's your fantasy? And how do I fit into it or rebel against it? And I don't even know that I trust you if I assume you don't have a fantasy about me. Because what is here to, to even love? Like, what are you trying to get from me? And that concept is triggering because you've always, you know yourself as somebody who they need you and they're trying to get something from you. Even if you don't know what it is, they're getting something from you and there's nothing left for you. So relationships are scary. Oh my God, there's going to be nothing left of me. I'm going to give it all away like I always do. Because these people, when you're raised by a narcissist, they never lean into you. Ever. You are always stepping out of you to get on their side and go, hey, like what's going on here? I, I'm, you're so disconnected. I'm coming so far out of myself to connect to you. And they never lean in and meet you in the middle. They always force you to come out their way. And then there's no person here that they can just like get in you and under your skin. That's how they get under your skin. Can't, you can't get them out, right? Because you step out and get on their territory because they're inviting you to. They go, oh, you should care about my trauma more than I do. And you go in to save them. They go, I don't want to be saved. That's a total codependent thing, right? I don't want to be saved. What are you, insulting me? You're a child. You have no idea how horrible my trauma is, blah, blah, blah. You are worthless. You can never save me. And there's never this leaning in to who you are as a person. You are always the one stepped out. So there's nothing here to be going on. And what gets in normally is narcissistic people then. And then you grow up either being in a relationship with a narcissist or being in a normal relationship and becoming a narcissist. And only uh, based on patterns. And what I mean by this is if you are employing patterns to live under the roof of a narcissist who's supposed to take care of you, but there's never a safe place. There's never that point of connection that healthy relationships have. I Mind you, I've been in a healthy relationship for 10 years now. And that took a lot of training on my part, a lot of training. I'm the trainer of this, right? Because it took so much work for me to receive what I have, um, to let it in, to stay in my body when it was coming in at me. Because that was another thing. Because then the, the flip side of that is you have to exit body sometimes because they come in. Right? If they're not coming in, you're totally stepped out to go meet them where they are. Or they're coming in and violating you. So that coming in phase, even in intimacy, I used to be very afraid of. Like, I would want to get it over with. Like, ah, oh, just hurt me now. Or like, do it now. So we, like, just this closeness was not comfortable. The way when I lay with my children, they feel comfortable to be close to me. I never knew that as a child and it took me a while to learn that as an adult in a healthy relationship. So my kind of demographic employs these defense mechanisms against narcissists and they apply those same defense mechanisms to healthy people. And in Earn Your Luck, I say that that is like, you know, um, what did I say? Bringing old principles to a new school right? Um, and I, if you can even think of the frequency of what that even means, like there's, a, I'm not saying one's bad or whatever. The energy is different. If you want bring a new, if you bring a new principle to a new school, you're going to have a different energy than if you bring old principle, an old principle to a new school. And I think the new school probably for the most part wouldn't hate, you know, having at least the blend of both, but like specifically having the freshness of a new principle. We bring old principles into healthy relationships. And then that makes us, and I don't do this work so you can change your behavior. I don't care about your behavior. I don't care. I don't think it's bad to go crazy bitch once in a while, right? Like be an animal. That's you. I care that you know how to receive your life and yourself. That when life comes at you and gives you a gift, you know how to let it in. I remember one time somebody gifted me her art and I said, oh, I can't take this. And she was, she was literal. she was a normal person. She was like, it's kind of insulting, you know? Like, I'm, I want you to have it. I'm giving it to you because I want you to have it. And I, that is what I did with God my whole life because I was taught, you're so unsatisfied. You're not grateful. So I thought I was being a good person by either receiving with guilt 
or not receiving at all. That didn't make me good. It made me void of personhood. And that's the kind of people that I work with that know, oh my God, my essence is in here. Like I know myself in here, but I do not know how to employ the self that I know because I'm so used to relating with employing tactics to survive through a narcissistic abuse situation. And that is something that I do not think even people who have only been with narcissists in intimate relationships can understand. The self that I have to go back to is not a 17-year-old self or 28-year-old self before I met a narcissist. The self that I have to go back to is literally starts from crawling, right? This is the work I've done, to learning how to walk, to like, and at one point it was crawling out of the gutter, right? First, I had to learn how to crawl. I didn't mobilize at all. Then I had to crawl out of the gutter. Then I had to walk on my knees in new terrain for a while. Then I had to, and this isn't about the external world, right? This isn't about me changing things in the external world. It's my inner terrain had to learn who I am, had to, from the ground up, fill me with me without that relational responsibility to somebody else's needs and somebody else's desire for you to give them supply by either fighting them or appeasing them, right? There's ne there was never an in-between for me. I was either, I was doing what my mom wanted or we were fighting. And I thought that that was a relationship. Not because I'm a narcissist, but because I have, I didn't have any reference other than narcissistic abuse for ways to relating. And my work and my channel and in my private practice as a therapist is to help people know how to relate, to re-show them, to model them on the ground what their parents and teachers never taught them. That, no, if somebody hits you, yeah, you're allowed to hit them back, right? If, if you're being harmed, you're allowed to stand for yourself. That doesn't mean, oh, what'd you do? People, if, if a boy broke up with me, what do you think I heard? <laughs> What'd you do? Who's ever going to, my mom would literally place bets. Nobody's ever going to want you. I wasn't allowed to individuate from her projections of my rebellion. I wasn't a rebel. I was myself, right? And she projected because I didn't live into her fantasy of my perfection that I was used goods. She would tell me all the time, you're damaged goods. When I, the first time I got pregnant, nobody's ever going to want you, you're damaged goods. I mean, she would always find a reason to tell me that. Um, and I would think, is this, you know, one time I said to her, I'd rather have a boy not like me than my husband cheat on me. She'd punch me right in the face. We didn't say a word for hours, right? Um, that was like one of the only times I ever came back at her with something like that, right? Um, so she would, I, I never understood how she didn't care about the fact that like she had no room to talk. She, she had no, like she had, she had a horrible relationship. Um, and she projected onto me that I was, and that's another thing, you know, I realized, and I think this is a lot of my demographic. Um, my parents said that their relationship ended when I was born and my mom said her life ended when I was born because she gave it all to me. Right. I didn't ask for that. I didn't care if she had friends. I would love to see be modeled friends, right? Like, what would it be like if my mom had friends? My mom had fun and she danced. What would that be like? Who would she be as a person? I would love to know that, right? But they saw me as a lost opportunity, not a person. And I took that on as I am a lost opportunity. I don't deserve opportunity. Opportunities that find me are dangerous because they're trying to kind of like do something because they don't see that I'm actually a lost opportunity. They don't know that I'm damaged goods, right? And for a long time, I believed that shit. Being in a healthy relationship after narcissistic abuse takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to be willing to relearn um, not even how to be in relationships. See, that's the part. It's like, it all transcends to everything else, right? When you can be in relationship to yourself, which is what you were not allowed to have in a narcissistic relationship, you know then that that relationship with yourself is the core that just emanates out layer by layer to your personal relationships, to your work relationships, to your home life, everything. When you have a solid relationship with that, self that 
they have it they have systematically torn down every time you would build something new they would tear it down when you can stay psychologically distant enough from that programming and that projection and you can build yourself your own character right and be all in the essence of that character and receive the plot of the kingdom that you've been given with the cards you've been dealt when you can do that when you're in position position that's when you expand that's when positions expand that's when your life gets better your relationships get better because you're all there but when you're not there because you're like well what's your agenda and i can't be here because if i was you would surely hurt me um, expressing yourself when you're in a narcissistic relationship is absolutely not allowed unless you're expressing something about them, right? So um, my work and my dedication on this channel is, you know, I welcome all of you. I'm so glad you're here to the, you know, 26,000 people that are here right now that I've never done an intro video and I'm just kind of always flying by the seat of my pants and you hang out with me and you go along my journey with me. Um, I thank you for being here. And I think I'm, I'm, welcoming of people who have been traumatized in narcissistic abuse as an intimate relationship or with somebody and i'm very cautious because i don't love to talk about the narcissist right i have you know 200 videos up um i don't really talk about the narcissist very much because my journey i want you to read ernie locks i'm not going to give all of that away but i believe our work is to recognize the narcissistic programming in us to accept it with compassion and that and only then is this is universally true only in true acceptance does anything change nothing ever changes when you resist it doesn't change when you resist it when you can fully accept what something is which for me that's why i started out this video saying my work has transformed i i did not accept the term narcissist for my family um, because they never appeared grandiose. Um, they were very self-deprecating and their desire for grandiosity. So they, I didn't realize that they were using that as a wanting you to build them up to their own image of grandiosity. And if you weren't going to, they would self-deprecate, but really they had this, you know, Thing that they were going oh I'm gonna come down here for you to self-deprecate but really I'm letting you know I'm up here I'm not really there I'm just saying that to see what you'll say um I didn't want to use those labels because it's a nuanced thing right we're all nuanced I don't I don't love labels and diagnostics I think that they can change as it is um but what I realize is m when I say that I have seen my parents become different they have behaviorally changed a hundred percent it is i can do holidays and be in my own self and not fear them i can i don't and that's because i change i change my expectation i changed my reality in my mind thinking i can't save this person she's literally not asking me to, she doesn't care she's not even asking to be saved she has made you get into her so much that you feel what she won't feel and you can't even feel yourself anymore so I had to ch I changed my expectations and when I say when I can say okay yes it's classic it's obvious that's clearly what this is then I can accept that and know that yeah that they, they're never you know I asked my dad once like how come because I used to tell him I loved him every night before he went to bed and he never once said it back I was the little kid going good night daddy I love you Chris every night would not go to sleep without telling one of his kids he loves him and the dichotomy of that is unbelievable. Like I thought everybody grew up like me. I had no idea. That's why I want to work with children of narcissists because we literally don't want to call it what it is. And then we have no idea that there is healthy, normal people in the world that we have been sheltered from and told, this is how you relate to the world, face reality. This is reality. This is what it's like to be on planet Earth. When other people are being held by their partners and they see their parents kiss. Yesterday, my son, my, my partner and I were in the kitchen and we we're embracing and he kissed me and my son goes, you guys are cute. He's three years old. My son goes, you guys are cute. It is so cute to me that he thinks we're cute. But people I come from would not know how to receive that if they didn't do a shit ton of work. And they wouldn't know how to give it either, but specifically they wouldn't know how to receive it. They, they would give it out of obligation and then resentment, right? 
they wouldn't know how to receive it. And they would think it was probably cheesy. Um, but their children certainly wouldn't see that. My children know that that push and pull is not normal. And it doesn't have to be their life and their way of relating to the world. So my work is to help integrate and help the people who only can understand what I'm talking about right now, not individuate from their parents and the paradigm so much. It's to individuate from the frequency of hell that you are literally in. And my benefit is I've always, I've always just looked up. I've always seen some sort of light and I still see that in my parents, right? Um, but I'm realistic about how big that light is at this point. And I'm realistic about how big mine is and which one I'm supposed to fuel and tend to. So their changes have, you know, in a way they've changed for the better because I have stopped going to them, right? Um, but their changes are real. They're in reality. Like I feel more comfortable to tell my mom, like that's absolutely not happening. You're not doing that here, right? Um, that wouldn't have been true for me before and it would she wouldn't have been able to receive it. And the only way that both have changed is because I changed the way I relate to my vertical and horizontal self. And it's not even about the way I relate to her. Now she has to relate to me because I'm related to myself at this point. And my problem is always, and this is why I think we really have to look at the inner narcissist and in the, in the self because my problem is I used to relate um, only to her and I related to everybody like I related to her. And I didn't want to relate that way, but I thought that, that those were the rules for relating. And I want my demographic to understand that relating actually feels connected. It feels like you could get that close to somebody and you don't have to fall in and you don't have to lean out, but you can relate to them. And that's how I feel with all levels of myself at this point. So when I say I see a person who she don't know how to relate, okay, I'm not going to try to relate to her anymore. If she wants to relate, she's going to relate to me. So my expectations about that change. So I'm not saying don't go no contact with your family. I'm not saying anything like that. What I am saying is I am here and my work and my channel is dedicated to children of narcissists who literally, they're, you're going to come out with ways of employing, I'm going to say it again, those tactics because you think that that is what the other is and i hope to give you a new model for another that is nurturing that is in her own self that's i'm not stepping out anymore right i hope to give you a model of somebody who won't won't step out who knows what it's like to step out and i also you know i have to do a lot of work at this point to because that was a thing like they would come in and I would be like okay they're coming in and it would be a, a literal almost an ease to my psyche because then it would be over whatever that tension in the cycle was that they were coming in they're gonna hurt you it would be over right so I have to even now know I'm not gonna shrink and let people in right which I used to do I would step out or let them totally in and that was because I was half stepped out I'm not half stepped out anymore. And my work is to help you anchor into your entire vertical self and stay there when the ping pong of the relating field goes, oh, they want me to step out of position. I'm stepping out of position. Oh my God, he wants this, she wants this. My work is to help you stay here because you are here. I am here now. I am here now, right? On a day, Judith had this, uh, she had us do this exercise that we changed the like, I am. I am here now. I am here now. I am here now. I am here now, right? I am here now. And nobody can take what I've built away because I've built it. I wasn't raised, right? Um, I have built this. That's not something I was ever allowed to initiate when I should have when I was a child. A normal child gets to build themselves along the way with support and foremaning from their parents. I didn't have a foreman and I was constantly demolished. And the agenda was demolish her, right? Um, so the thing that I've built is a 
thing that I know that I am. And sometimes I'm insane, right? But at least I know what I am because I have taken off these, this suffocating cloud of I, this is how she related. This is how I'm supposed to relate. So I must be that thing. I must be bad. And it's nothing like I really got into this work. If you read Ernie Luck, because a chick that I had technically saved, right? Like she, I let her into my life at first. She would, she, I would like call her and invite her out. She never wanted to come out. And then all of a sudden she would say, oh, I, I expect my friends to call me every day. And I was like, yeah, I'm not I'm really ever going to be that friend. Like I got two kids. I'm not doing that. Um, and then I ended up calling her every day. Right. And we ended up hanging out every single day and total, like let her in my entire world, my entire social life. And, uh, when I set a serious boundary with her, she told somebody that I suffered from narcissistic personality disorder. And I really looked into like, why would she say that? Like, what, like, what does that even mean? Cause I only had really textbook knowledge of it. I didn't know I had lived under that realm my entire life. Right. So of course I attracted somebody who would make me think I was that thing also when really I was employing these tactics kind of with her in a way, because she wanted things for me. I was not able to give her, I wasn't her partner, whatever. I wasn't able to give her what she wanted out of me. So, um, she, she didn't like my boundary and she told me I was a psycho. I suffered from you know, novels of went on the whole slander campaign. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, I'm really going to look into this narcissism thing. And I was like, oh my God, it's classic. It's obvious. I watched like two th YouTube videos that were like, you know, mother narcissists. And I was like, oh my God, it's a real thing. It's like a real thing. It's a real frequency. It's a real channel. It's a real thing that happens. And to deny that that was the programming I was working on would be stupid. It saved my life, right? Because I recognized what she taught me and I recognized what I was teaching based on what she taught me. And it was, I was always, you know, I was very young when I started to do the work, but I would find it really hard to even sit with my two-year-old and play with him, right? Like connecting to life here was not something I ever knew how to do. I was never allowed to get this close without some weird, either like sexual tension or some weird, like, I'm going to hit you. Like there was, I was never allowed to be this close to anything in my life. I was told you're a reject, go over there, right? That's what we're told. And then when we have healthy people who actually want to love us like we deserve, we go, oh, you must be the reject. Because if you don't see how rejected I am and how damaged I am, like, I just don't get it. Like, I don't know what you see. And then it, it just doesn't work with that program still at work in you, right? That program's not working for you. If you're on my channel, the program no longer works for you. And you have to find a new program that you work at for a hot minute and then it works for you. The work works. It's fascinating. It's amazing. So if you are a child of a narcissist, my work is dedicated to helping you be you instead of helping you you know, you had to think like them because that was the only source of anything that you had. Um, even if you didn't feel like them, like everything always felt fake. I was like, oh my God, like I, I'm the only one who feels like I was like a colorful kid in like a pitch black house, right? Um, and I cared about things they didn't care about. And, you know, uh. so my work is to help you be you. Um, and stop suffocating under the weight of them when you're thinking about, oh, how do they think? What are they thinking? We're always combating that projection in some way or like fawning to it. We can just stop thinking about what they're thinking about and start thinking about what we're thinking about. Right? That's the work. Okay. I'm Stacey Hoke. Again, psychotherapist, somatic embodiment coach, mama of four. And you know my work at this point. Um, that's why I'm here. That's why I share on this channel. It is not so that my story makes you feel pity for me. Um, I don't need your pity. I don't need anything from you at this point. I hope that you can get to a place where you can recognize you don't need anything from other people either, right? I'm not saying like in an inval, I'm not like, obviously we need people. We're interdependent beings. We're a social species. But what I mean is that sense of Oh, I used to not want to brand and share myself because I would think, oh, people are going to think because I was raised under that way. I'm trying to get something from them. If I say what I am, they're going to hurt me. They're going to tell me I should get off the stage, basically. Or they're going to think I'm trying to get something from them because I'm not allowed to want.
because everything, you know, I'm ungrateful if I want more. So even sharing, hey, I'm Stacy. This is what I do. I didn't want to do that because I felt like it was predatory. Like I was stepping onto your space instead of going, oh, wait, you're a person who can choose to turn off the thing if you want, right? Like I had no concept of it's okay to express myself and be me without feeling like somebody was going to come slap the shit out of me for it. So I want to help you live a life that you are at ease, that does not provoke you, does not prod at you, but provides for you. Um, I have let it in. I never had a mother who leaned in and I didn't know a life that I could let lean in. And now life leans in and I lean out and we meet it in the middle. We meet in the middle and it's intimate and I love it and I know how to receive it and I know how to give to it. Like I said the other day, I'll never be this coach who's like, oh, get a landscaper and get house cleaners and things like that. My house works for me. My garden works for me. I love these things and I meet them in the middle by tending to them and touching them and and being with them, not because I don't want to get a house cleaner or, something, or not because I can't afford a house cleaner, blah, blah, blah. It's because I want to meet my life in the middle and receive the things that I actually have instead of going, oh, I don't want to receive this because I know what this is like. Because I have to get to the next stage, um, whatever that stage is, right? I have to get to the next house. I can't receive this one. This was supposed to be transient. Um, I don't want to live a life that I can't receive anymore. And part of my reception is doing the work that I know works for me, that provides for me. My house provides for me. My piping provides for me. I want to touch it. I want to be in communion with it um, because it's a gift to me that I want to receive fully. I've always been that person. My mom would tell me, no, you're not you lazy, blah, blah, blah. Right. She would think that, uh, you know, even now she's sick and at work. She calls that work ethic. I call it lack of boundaries. She used to tell me, I used to go to work consistently sick. I thought that that was the thing to do that made me a good person with good work ethic. It made me an asshole, especially because I worked with kids. Um, I thought that was me being good. Nobody taught me a normal way of having a boundary with myself or with the world even. There was no boundaries. I was stepping out or somebody stepping in. There's no delineation or, or sovereignty there. And... My work is to help you get sovereign and to know your own edge. So if you're actually interested in knowing your own edge, go take um, my course called Soul Centering After Toxic Shame. Because I really, you know, my tagline is get real centered. Because how could you possibly feel real when your whole life you've been asked to live in somebody else's like fantasy land? And you didn't even know it. And then you come out into the real world and you're like, you know, they threaten you with the real world, by the way you read earn your luck that's a big thing in there they threatened me with the real world the real world was exactly where I wanted to be oh my god so much easier being an adult this is amazing oh my god I love it right this is the, this if this is the real world this was the heaven I was waiting for and they told me I wouldn't be able to make it and I'd be terrified and it would be hell no right so my work is to help people get real when they have never been allowed ever and that's a real thing that a lot of people can really not understand. They've never been allowed to be real. They had to be a puppet on strings. And coming off of those strings, you're like, where's my puppet here? I don't know, somebody, please, <laughs> somebody. And then you find somebody who's willing to puppet you and that's really dangerous. They're always gonna be dangerous, right? Um, or you find somebody who actually loves you who goes, hey, come dance with me in the horizontal world. And you're gonna be like, I don't know dance moves, like what? Nobody told me I was allowed to have fun or dance. And they're going to be like, yeah, just come on. I'll show you. Just do what I do. And it takes a lot of courage to get out on that dance floor and the horizontal at that point with somebody who isn't trying to puppet you. It's amazing. I'm so excited for your possibility of um, having an honest and amazing relationship. I will never, that's another thing. Like I love waking up every day in my bed next to somebody who loves me. Um, my whole life, I didn't think I deserved that. I mean, I want to deserve it. I want to be good enough. And the fun piece is I don't even have to be good. He just loves me. I don't have to do anything ever. He just loves me. So different. 
whole new real world. This is the real world. They told me if I went to, I would disintegrate. And I have become here. And I love it here. And I want to get you here. So, mwah, bye.